Real-world data are generated when patients receive novel approved drugs in the clinical practice outside clinical trials. And there's often the question, can we bring that in reality, what was shown in the clinical trials leading to approval? And therefore, real-world data are very important. And they are also important to generate more information about toxicity and life quality. We know that many patients receiving novel approved drugs would not fulfill the inclusion criteria of the trial leading to approval. Uh, we know that about 40% of patients would not fulfill these inclusion criteria. This is mainly due reduced organ function, reduced blood cell counts, pre-treatments and um, other concerns uh, which would prevent the patient from participating in a clinical trial. However, in the real world, we know that also patients not per se meeting the strict inclusion criteria are absolutely of need. Uh, to have access to this in innovative drug. So real world data show what really happens when a drug is on the market and does this is realized what was promised. Uh, for this, um, we do more and more effort to generate those data. Uh, also to be critical in regard of our own data, um, can we transport this? And I give you an example. We just recently showed data of the so-called locomotion trial. This was a prospective trial where patients were included as they would get an innovative therapy like CAR T cells or biospecifics, but received um, the drugs, the individual treating physician prescribed and data were documented and uh, this study was done for so-called triple refractory patients so patients not anymore responding to proteasome inhibitors immunomodulating age, agents and uh, the monoclonal anti-cd38 antibody and what we saw is that those patients received more than 90 different regimens showing that there is no established standard, for example, showing that there's an unmet need for novel drugs. We also generated, for example, um, real-world data on, a, on Selenex or a novel oral drug, which was approved recently in the US, also in Europe. Um, and in the pivotal trial, the were significant side effects regarding gastrointestinal toxicity or nausea um, and um, there were supportive care measures established however the concern was that probably if the drug is out patients will not pretty well deal with that however real world data uh, in um, the us and also in belgium showed that um, the patients taking this drug outside the clinical trials could deal in the same manner with the drug and the uh, results were exactly mirrored. Uh, so, uh, and there was a striking abstract at ASCO where the US colleagues from the Moffitt Cancer Center reported about the first close to 200 patients receiving the CAR T cells in the clinical practice after approval. And it was really astonishing all of us that the data of the so-called KARMA trial, which, which uh, established the CAR T cell treatment, were exactly mimicked. Uh, so a median progression-free survival in KARMA was reported with 8.8 .8 months. 
and in this uh, real world um, evidence uh, database it was 8.9 months. However, it is good if we confirm that, that we can transport our results into clinical reality, but we cannot be sure that this is always true. So we need to generate continuously real world data and even expand this, looking more into a life quality patient reported outcome that we really can confirm after approval that a drug is in any sense, in sense of response, in sense of survival, and in sense of life quality, beneficial for our patients. This is a very important question and also advice. In a clinical trial, you have always to balance out with the inclusion criteria who you can include because you need a homogeneous, a comparable population. And you, at this time, you have not this broad experience with the drug you have a bit later. So you have also to assure patient safety, patients who are included in clinical trials, they need to be protected, they need to be safe. And on the other hand, you want to generate broad data and you want to generate rapidly your data to get a novel investigation to approval. And so it's always a balance between being very broad and being very strict. And at the end, those inclusion and exclusion criteria are a mix of those proposed in the protocol, but also those um, which might be entered or assigned by the competent authorities or the uh, other um, authorities being involved. And um, one always tries to uh, to make this as good as possible for a trial, but there's always a border and we absolutely should continuously review this. For example, yesterday evening I was involved in a clinical trial planning and all experts urged the company uh, which will conduct the trial uh, to lower the inclusion criteria in regards of uh, the renal function so that patients with significant renal function impairment can be included in such a trial. And this is what we sometimes do. And it's uh, therefore very necessary that all parties um, talk together and give an advice on those criteria and also that patients and patient organizations and patient advocates are involved in clinical trial planning.